They're smart, sensitive and playful. You've got these little orphans that are coming back here and be going off and living in the wild. It's amazing. And have seen their parents cut down due to poaching. Yet thanks to the work of one woman and an incredible team behind her, these elephants have a brighter future. Join me as I journey to Kenya to learn more about one of the most unique conservation programs in the world. Wildlife is under threat like never before. Man-made climate change, habitat loss and illegal poaching are devastating the world's environments. We've lost half the animal species on the planet in the last 40 years, and all large marine life could become extinct by 2050. I'm Shawnee Davis, a photographer, filmmaker, and conservationist with a passion for adventure. I photographed some of Asia's most glamorous celebrities, and now I'm turning my camera on nature's true beauty. I'm out to showcase the glory of the natural world and raise critical awareness about poaching and exploitation. Join me on Adventures to the Edge. The magnificent African elephant. It's the largest land animal on the planet. Standing four meters tall and weighing over six tons, a fully grown elephant is an imposing sight. But today, elephants are being slaughtered to feed a booming market in Asia. Up to 35,000 elephants are now being illegally poached every year across Africa. That's nearly one every 15 minutes. Taking ivory from an elephant means killing it. And it also has a devastating knock-on effect across elephant families, leaving young elephants traumatized, vulnerable, and alone. I'm on the outskirts of Nairobi in Kenya to visit a unique conservation program, one that's reintroducing the victims of poaching back into the wild. Here, since 1977, they've been taking in orphans, elephant orphans. This orphanage is liked and so well known that plenty of celebrities have made it here too. The grounds are on the edge of Nairobi National Park and teeming with wildlife. There's a warthog family as well as a pair of ostriches and a blind rhino. But the stars of the orphanage, the baby elephants themselves, are here because they have lost their parents due to poaching or have been separated from their families. Until they can be returned to the wild in a few years, this is their home, where today 30 of them eat, play, walk, and sleep. Each one has a name, and each one has a keeper. All of them have one woman to thank, 80-year-old Dame Daphne Sheldrick. With elephants, if you treat them only with tender, loving care and kindness, then the rewards are immense, because when they're actually living wild, they choose to keep in touch with us. They treat us to their wild-born young, bring the babies back to show the human family that they love. Dame Sheldrick explains what it takes to keep the elephants happy. The keepers have got to love them literally from the heart, because elephants can read your mind and your heart. People say, how do you choose the keepers? Well, the answer is we don't. But if he's got the right heart and the right soul, the elephants will gravitate towards him and they will love him right from the start. Nobody knows this better than head keeper Edwin Lucici. He's in charge of the 28 staff, all devoted to taking care of the elephants 24-7. The best aspect of it is uh, having new guys coming in and training them and seeing them uh, actually going on well with the elephants, uh, staying with them, being friends, being very close to the elephants, asking lots of questions, wanting to know more about the elephants and everything around. That makes me feel great. The staff and keepers are careful not to get too attached to any one particular elephant. Painful experience has taught everyone here that when the elephants become too attached to one keeper, problems can occur. It becomes a problem when they're not there. And so we rotate. At night, some of the elephants spend with the keepers. And so it is a different elephant with a different keeper every night. In the day, we take care of them as a group so that they're not really attached to one person. Edwin takes me out into the bush where the elephants are feeding and enjoying the morning sun. Nothing can quite prepare me for the sight of 30 orphan elephants all jostling for attention at once. What an amazing introduction to these elephants. I mean, they're quite strong. Yeah, very strong. Surprisingly strong. 
because you think they're cute and cuddly, but they can knock me over quite easily. But what are the difficulties with handling these incredible creatures at such a young age? It's very difficult to bring them up because elephants are very clever and very intelligent. Right. And so they do remember a lot. So they can remember what they've gone through to lose their mothers. As you can imagine, they're also very curious and make things a little difficult for our camera crew. They spend most of the day eating, which is not surprising given that they're building huge bodies from only milk and plant material. What's incredible about being out here with these young elephants is just to see how playful they are and how human-like they really are. I mean, they're kind of like kids and they, as you expect from kids, they get dirty, they muck around, they're a bit boisterous, sometimes a bit moody. But uh, it's really quite remarkable how much of a character they have. Whoa, there you go. Proof's in the pudding. Seeing them so happy, it's hard to believe that they have already been through so much trauma. I learn of Bagu, just 10 months old, who has spear marks on her body due to poachers. Every elephant is learning to overcome their intense past, one that they may never forget. We've raised 200 successfully, and we've lost, lost almost that. You know, the milk formula is not absolutely as it should be. They're very fragile animals, and they're psychologically fragile as well. Some of them just don't want to live. They, don't, they just want to die. When they've lost their elephant family, you've got to try and turn that round. The day continues with another feeding, which members of the public can watch. And by doing so, the trust hopes that they will adopt the orphans for a nominal fee. Visitors come from all over the world to see elephants that they have adopted as one of their own. They come from South Africa. Well, my son has adopted one of the elephants here and we've sort of grown up with elephants and I think it's important to put back. And even Canada. I'm just not happy to be here. It's like a dream. Each person who adopts an elephant gets regular updates. In return, the orphanage gets much needed funds to keep this program going. It's time to head back out into the park where the elephants feed, socialize and learn from each other. The older orphans play with the younger, newer arrivals and teach them the ways of the bush. They even get to play football, but they won't be playing in the World Cup anytime soon. We're gonna get a glimpse into the world of how a keeper keeps an elephant growing and healthy. The keepers have to prepare 18 liters of milk for the elephants every day. So they have a feeding every three hours, 24 seven, and that's a big job. It's also a lot of milk. I spend the rest of the afternoon with the elephants out in the bush. But all too soon, the day is over and the elephants make their way back to the stockades. And now it's time for them to get tucked in by their keepers. And we're gonna go into the stockade and see just what it's like to sleep with the little baby elephants. All the youngest elephants have a keeper who stays with them each night. Tonight, Peter is staying with Kamok, who was found wandering alone in the bush her mother probably killed by poachers. The little, little ones normally lie down on the floor. But the elder ones don't. But the elder ones will sleep while standing. Ah. Uh, okay. Like the little ones, they normally lie down. Okay, and how long do they sleep normally for? Roughly for two and a half hours. Really? Because we normally feed them after every, every three hours. And your stay. job is to look after the elephants and stay with them every night? Yes. Do you have a girlfriend? I have a fun, a wife. <laughs> <laughs> but does she get jealous? Not so really. <laughs> It's time for Peter and Kamok to get a few hours sleep before their next feeding in about three hours. We've spent some wonderful time with the orphans as well as the keepers who are full of stories and love for these elephants. And the orphans show their love for the keepers and treat them almost like their parents. And for anyone who has any doubt about the intelligence of these creatures, they must come here and experience for themselves the true wonder of the elephants. Because of the tireless dedication and hard work of the staff at the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, these wonderful elephants have a future. But that future is not in Nairobi. 
Join me in part two as I enter the wilderness of Kenya's largest national park and find out how the trust is reintegrating these orphans back into the wild. The greatest gift you can give it is freedom. While I'm saying goodbye to the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Nairobi, the journey for me and the elephants is not over. I'm heading south to Savo East National Park, 14,000 square kilometers of wilderness, where the elephants have something they can't get in Nairobi, space. The greatest gift you can give it is freedom. The elephants need space. They're the bulldozers of nature, recycling the trees. And if the elephants were to disappear, uh, then a lot of other species would go extinct as well. It's a 10-hour journey into the wilds of southwest Kenya, where paved roads soon give way to dirt tracks. At last, we reach the entrance to Savo National Park and enter a wilderness the size of the U.S. state of Connecticut. I arrive at Ithumba, an eco-friendly four-tented camp with plenty of space to roam, outdoor showers, and the opportunity to see the wildlife up close. What is remarkable about this camp is that it's only 10 minutes from the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust Ithumba Elephant Orphanage. Around 30 elephant orphans from Nairobi live here at any one time. It's here that the elephants begin their rehabilitation into the wild. It's a bruising 6 a.m. start the next morning, and I meet with head keeper Benjamin Robert, also known as the Elephant Whisperer. Apparently you can talk to the elephants. Yeah, I can talk to the elephants. How, how is that possible? Once you have lived with them for many years, then there's a connection that you get from the elephants, mm. such that you can be communicating through feelings. Sometimes you just show them with your hand, and they understand mm. what uh, we would like them to do. So it's just simple, so long as you have worked with them for many years. 21 years to be exact. Then, while we're talking, something extraordinary happens. <laughs> it, uh, we have some wild elephants coming through. What we're seeing here is incredible. We're seeing the ex-orphans who now live in the wild coming back. They're feeding at the watering hole. They're coming back to greet and to communicate with the orphans who are still being taken care of by the keepers here. We're seeing firsthand that communication between the ex-orphans and the orphans, showing you just how social and smart these animals are. They obviously remember each other. They're obviously friendly with each other. And this is how this program works. It works by releasing the orphans into the wild and helping the ex-orphans reintegrate, and the ex-orphans helping the new orphans integrate. After their early milk feed, the elephants are let out en masse to graze, play, and mix with the wild elephants. While most of the elephants can't wait to get out, a few linger in the hope of getting more food. Benjamin introduces me to some of the personalities. This is uh, Keleki, he's also a boy. He is three years old. He comes from Mount Kenya region. He's Narok, who is uh, three and a half years. Uh, she comes from Masai Mara. She was uh, found near a town called Narok. She was all alone without anyone. Out in the bush, the elephants will eat and mingle for hours. Benjamin explains the intricacies of their behavior. The ex orphans uh, teach us the new orphans first uh, language, which they should use when communicating with the others. Secondly, they teach them uh, behavior how they should behave when they, they are in the company of the matrix, mm. the big bulls, the dominant ones. The other thing is uh, vegetation, poisonous and non-poisonous, plants that uh, act as medicine to their bodies. Mm. So when they are not feeling well, they can know which particular tree or root to go for. Elephants communicate by touch, but over long distances, they use something called infrasound. by a deep lamp, rambu, then it dies away. Something that we think that maybe it has stopped communicating, but it continues. You never get tired of watching them. Each day is always different. They do something different from what they did the previous day. It's an extraordinary sight to see the ex-orphans coming back from the wild and greeting the new orphans. 
They're also coming back for water, which is hard to find during the dry season. The trust trucks in up to 25,000 liters of water every three days to satisfy the elephant's enormous thirst. I meet Wendy at the watering hole. Wendy epitomizes the success of the rehabilitation program. She's a former orphan, fully reintegrated into the wild, and now pregnant with her own calf. And so she still remembers humans, but a true success story, an orphan reintroduced into the wild and having her own baby in a few months' time. Towards midday, the orphans get a chance to cool off at a nearby mud bath. First, for the younger elephants, there's a midday feeding of Sheldrick's special formula milk. Clearly, they cannot wait. And now for a bit of mud. After their cooling mud bath, the elephants head for a sand pit where they cover themselves in red earth. They're clearly enjoying it, but the dirt also serves to protect them from the flies and midday sun. Ithumba clearly gives these elephants the freedom and life they richly deserve. But danger is never far away. Poaching is an ever-present threat. Nick Trent runs the field operations of the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. He oversees planes, helicopters, and nine anti-poaching teams on the ground. At last count, there were over 11,000 elephants living in Savo. On average, Nick and his team deal with 40 illegal incursions into the park every month. Nick takes me up in his plane, and I quickly get a sense of the landscape's incredible beauty as well as the challenge he faces patrolling this vast area. The more you fly, the more you really know what's happening and where the hotspots are. Basically monitor the elephant and keep an eye on the elephant because we know that wherever the elephant are, the poachers will be. A, a key method of poaching out here is just building a shooting blind on a water hole. He sits there waiting for the ellies to come in and Back on the ground, I asked Nick about the poaching issue. The Somali with his AK-47 has been more devastating in the fact that they can gun down a whole family. Two years ago, 11 elephants were killed on the Tiva River. Those were all shot. The tusks were removed right there. More effective and dangerous poaching is the arrow poacher because he can come in. Two men can operate for two weeks in, inside the park and they're pretty much undetected unless our ground teams pick them up. Where they are getting more sophisticated is the cell phone because they can text each other, they can text their pickup guy and they can communicate with their dealer. The motorbike and the cell phone make it very easy for that ivory to disappear quickly. The trust employs teams of rangers who are out in the park daily. I tag along with one patrol. Later, the anti-poaching unit shows me more deadly traps and weapons that have actually killed elephants. They include poison arrows and heavy wire coils that trap the elephant's legs. And you've seen elephants trapped by this? Yeah. Yeah? Just uh, near the gate. That's a you very... cut the leg of the, of the elephant. Cut the leg of the elephant. Oh. Did you manage to save the elephant this time? Mm -hmm. No. It died. So another crude method primitive form of trapping the elephant. I mean, imagine the pain that the elephant suffers before it dies. Another reason why we should end the ivory trade. 
Due to the tireless work of the trust, not only in protecting wild elephants in Savo via constant air and ground patrols, but also through their extraordinary orphan rehabilitation program, elephants have a future here in this part of Africa. But with one elephant now being killed every 15 minutes on the continent, over 35,000 in 2013 alone, the only long-term solution is an end to the ivory trade. I think Hong Kong being on the doorstep of China has a major role to play in, in the future of elephants. A piece of ivory sitting on your dining room table or in your chair or on your office desk is really what purpose does that serve? So if I had a magic wand, I would like to make ivory so untrendy that no one buys it. I'm out late with Benjamin and the orphans when truly wild elephants come closer for the first time. The wild elephants are clearly wary of any human presence. It's a potentially dangerous situation. See the difference of behavior as soon as they see a human? They do a mock kind of defense for preparing for a mock charge. You know, the ex orphans have got us told to tell their life. Right. And how they have been taken care comfortably. And also, the ex orphans are the ones who are showing these wild ones we are to drink water because they have been here for long. So the wild ones benefit from it? Yeah, they benefit ah. from that. When those young elephants were taken in at the Sheldrick Trust in Nairobi, and through dedication of staff 24-7 for many years, bottle feeding them, caring for them, you see the end of that story here when the orphans come out, roam free and mix with the other wild elephants. That's a truly beautiful story, if not an inspiring one. I've witnessed the incredible bond formed between keepers and elephants. It's a lifetime bond that neither will forget. But ultimately, home for these elephants is with other elephants, out in the wild, where they belong. For these elephants, it's time to return home. Next week on Adventures to the Edge, there are only five northern white rhinos left on the planet, and we'll meet three of them. 